Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool. Happy Friday. Happy E3 Eve, everybody. Tomorrow, we start to get all the news. It starts to, tri I mean, it's already starting to trickle in. The leaks are everywhere. People have been releasing video content. We know a lot of the big announcements and a lot of the stuff that's coming, but uh, the deluge is really going to get started tomorrow with Electronic Arts and then definitely on Sunday with uh, Xbox and Bethesda. And uh, then we are headed, Blake and I are headed down to Los Angeles, and we're going to be covering all of the big announcements and, uh, you know, checking out the Ubisoft press conference and the Square Enix press conference. I can't wait for that Avengers reveal. We've got a lot of fun things to get into today. Our guest is Jeff Kanata, who is part of a new show called The Dungeon Run. We're going to find out all about that and also talk about E3. But first, we have a rundown to get to. And uh, this one is dedicated to Casey Stockstill, uh, who says, Vic, so glad to rediscover G EP. Watched you on G4. And Lauren is great, as always. That's a comment on our uh, uh, recent interview with Lauren Lanning talking about Oddworld soul storm which is one of the big uh, games being revealed at e3 and i got some hands on time with that it was terrific uh all right let's get started with casey's rundown after more than a decade of problems, Nathan Drake is finally heading to theaters. Sony Pictures has announced that the long-in-development Uncharted movie will finally hit theaters on December 18th, 2020. Filming is slated to begin in the coming months with Spider-Man himself, Tom Holland, as the heroic lead, Nathan Drake, and the film is helmed by 10 Cloverfield Lane director Dan Trachtenberg. This brings to an end years of development hell. Hollywood first began working on an Uncharted movie when the first game came out in 2007, and it's gone through several different actors and directors since then. With a release date in place, it sounds like it's finally the real deal. And I'll tell you what, they got the right guy to direct this movie. Dan Trachtenberg used to be part of the uh, the group called The Totally Rad Show, working with Jeff Kanata, our guest today, uh, and Alex Albrecht, who uh, is the creator of The Dungeon Run. So all of the worlds are coming together, which is crazy. I love Tom Holland. I think he's a fantastic actor. He's uh, uh, my favorite of the spider people, the spider dudes. Um, actually, I think I'm, I might like the uh, the guy that plays uh, Miles Morales a little bit more. Uh, but uh, I do love him as Peter Parker. He's fantastic. He doesn't look like Nathan Drake to me. He's, he's a little too small. He's a little too young looking. Um, and I hate to be ageist. Uh, but, you know, maybe they're doing the kid version of Nathan Drake or whatever. But uh, I've already posted about this, um, you know, when Tom Holland was announced that he's going to be taking over the role. I, I still think that Miles Teller... Uh, should have been the guy. He has the physique and the look and the smart-ass kind of quality about him. I know I've heard that he's kind of a nightmare and he's, you know, done some things that have pissed people off. Okay, but, he, you know, if I was going to bank on a young guy to kind of grow into that role and represent that role and isn't already Spider-Man, I would probably go for somebody like that. You know, that's not to say Tom Holland won't do a great job. I have, uh, you know, immeasurable faith in him, uh, but even more faith in Dan Trachtenberg, who is an enormous fan of video games. I think he is on record talking about how much he would dream to be a uh, director on an Uncharted film. And I think he wanted probably to cast Jeff Kanata as Nathan Drake, uh, which would have been amazing. Um, I'm excited that this movie is coming. Uh, you know, it's clearly in the vein of the Indiana Jones films. That's what uh, Amy Hennig and all the people at Naughty Dog were uh, conceiving when they created the first Uncharted adventures for us. And, um, you know, I, I think there's there's tons of room in the uh, in movie theaters for films like this. Um, and I don't think they're going to go. I don't think they're going to screw it up. I think it's going to be OK. Um, but I think that they could have gone in some more interesting uh, maybe Robert Pattinson would have been a good... Oh, okay. Let's move on. Some big, massive changes have come to the Destiny universe. Developer Bungie has announced the first big changes they're making to the game following their split with publisher Activision. For starters, a slimmed-down version of the base game is going free-to-play, allowing anyone to jump in, with Bungie now earning their revenue from the sale of additional content like expansions. That additional content will also now be sold individually rather than in season pass bundles like before, so so players can buy the specific content that they want. 
Destiny 2 is also getting cross-platform saves, so you can jump from one system to the other. Finally, an all-new expansion called Shadowkeep is coming in September, offering new story missions and uh, in a new location on Earth's moon. Now that Bungie is in charge, all the decisions about the game will be made by them and not Activision, so fans obviously have very high hopes, especially given the game's shaky reputation up until now. I think this is uh, the right move on uh, Bungie's part, and I think it kind of... Um, suggests a future for the looter shooter genre in general, which is so uh, much based on uh, you, you know a buying public uh, coming and supporting your game over many, 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 many months and getting you know sucked into the experience with pals and saying, okay, well, let's keep meeting up every Tuesday night. And yes, of course, we're going to have to buy all the new stuff. To and, and that's what these games have been able to uh, monetize on already, but there has been this pretty high price this big you know you got to spend the the full priced amount to get in that ticket price was has been expensive and i think that has been um and this happened with destiny it happened uh, with uh the division it happened with anthem um that's been that sort of uh that consternation for fans out there people dig the whole concept and they they like the you know idea of sharing time and uh exploring these adventures but if it costs a lot of money up front, they want as much of that sort of content figured out for them as possible. And of course, it takes months and months and months for these massive epic scale, uh, you know, pieces of material to get built and delivered to everybody. And so there's been a lot of like, well, let's do it backwards and let's go this way. And everybody's green now, you know, and uh, that's pissed off a lot of people. And uh, so I think that this is the right approach. Give it to them for free. There's enough built between the two Destiny games now, uh, enough assets, enough worlds, enough uh, geometry, enough stuff that they can kind of pull from to build a, um, you know, a nice entree for people to kind of jump in and get a feel for it. And then they will pay if they get that hook. And I think Bungie is kind of banking on that they will. They've, they've had massive success at growing an audience. Um, there was a lot less skepticism about this kind of games as a service model when Destiny 1 was announced. Uh, and I think a lot of people felt a little bit burned that uh, they didn't get to just carry over right from Destiny 1 into Destiny 2. It was kind of like fresh start. Um, but I think this is kind of the, the right approach for a free-to-play model. And we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. But, I, you know, I, um, I'm excited to jump back in. I'm, I'm definitely excited to see uh, new people taking the chance to jump into this experience because it's world class. I mean, the one thing you can say about Destiny, even if it gets repetitive, even if it feels like, uh, uh, you know, you're spending a lot and you're, you're doing a lot of the same things over and over again, the mechanics are amazing. It's really fun and easy to play, and it's really fun to play with other people. So Bungie knows this. They're banking on themselves, and uh, I think it will be all right. We got uh, Jamie is excited about that. <laughs> all right, and one new platform that will run Destiny 2 and loads of other games is, Cl is Google's Stadia. The tech giant has announced launch details for their new cloud game streaming service. It will launch this November in North America and Europe and will offer a pro subscription tier, which costs 12 bucks a month in Canada and gives access to streaming in 4K at uh, 60 frames per second along with 5.1 surround sound. That's available by itself or as part of the $170 Founders Edition, that's what it costs in Canada, uh, which comes with a three-month subscription controller and other perks. After launch, there will be a cheaper base subscription tier which only uh, offers streaming in HD, so 1920 by 1080, and not 4K. Google says you'll need an internet connection of at least 35 megabits per second for everything to run smoothly at 4K. As for games, Stadia will launch with 30 titles, mostly from third-party publishers like Ubisoft, Bethesda, and EA, and there will also be an exclusive title called Guilt, uh, which is a survival horror game from the makers of Rhyme, and they spell Guilt uh, with G-Y-L-T, and they spell Rhyme with R-I-M-E. So someone needs to buy this uh, developer a dictionary. Uh, but uh, uh, people are wondering if uh, Stadia is going to be a success. And, of course, I've seen all kinds of YouTube videos popping up that they're ripping us off and they're charging and it's going to fail and this is, this is not going to launch properly and there's going to be all kinds of problems. And there may be. I think it's ridiculous to predict that now. I think it's um, uh, not beneficial to the games industry in general to to just uh, crap all over this concept. This is a concept that the business in general has been moving towards. 
if any company is kind of uh, situated well enough to kind of handle the mechanics and the monetary expenditures to be able to pull this off, it's Google or Amazon. It's one of these massive giants out there. And I think we should just take a bit more of a wait and see and... Um, you know, let's 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 project a little bit of optimism towards this idea. Yes, there's a lot of things in here that kind of different, uh, you know, ch change our whole access to this content. But I don't think that's a terrible thing. You know, the change is not a it's not something to be kind of horrified about. Um, they're going to be able to work out the deals with Internet service providers to be able to uh, uh, offer some special services, I'm sure, for people that are worried about, ca you know, hitting their cap on data or not having fast enough Internet. Google's banking on people having fast enough Internet for not just this, but for their future products. They're obviously thinking that video games are going to be a huge part of the entertainment diet out there. They're obviously thinking that why bother, you know, coming out with hardware to compete with all the other types of hardware that are out there when they can do all the server side kind of number crunching and give us, you know, you know, hopefully, at least in their in their pitch and their presentation and their speculation um, and in their planning, stuff that we can't even run on systems that are, you know, not thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for us to buy now, you know, with RTX cards and ray tracing and all that. So, I mean, this, the games conceivably that they're going to be able to stream to us are going to look incredible. Now, I know it seems impossible. It sounds like a, a future that uh, um, is years away, not months away. But I want to give Google the benefit of the doubt. I, you know, I want to, I, I'm hoping that there is a, a, some success with this. They had a successful test of uh, 1080p Assassin's Creed last year. Um, and I think uh, they have very smart people and they've got big, big dollars in the bank. So, you know, let's see how they do with all this. Because what will happen if this works is more people will play. It will drive the access to games uh, and the barrier to games down a little bit, which means more um, consumers sort of jumping in. And of course, they'll get the free games that Stadia is going to be offering, but they'll, they'll try some things. And think about how many times you've been in a store or even in your own library and you haven't clicked on a game to download it or you've gone to you have decided not to go to the shelf to go and pick one up and stick it into your machine just because you don't want to waste that time of loading and then waiting for something to kind of update and all that imagine the idea and this is all you know we haven't it hasn't been really been proved out yet i get that but imagine the idea of i heard this was cool i'm going to try it boom you're in it you're playing it instantly that's a pretty cool future. That's a pretty cool concept. And I think that's going to lead to people, uh, you know, tasting all kinds of new ideas and new types of games. And then that's inevitably going to lead to investment in creating new types of content that kind of transforms the business into a more accessible one, you know. And it may uh, you, you challenge the games as service model um, directly like the fact that you get all of this stuff that destiny is going to be selling as part of your stadia uh subscription you get that 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 first game it's all yours all of that stuff is unlocked including the new expansion pack so it it has the potential to really ratify everything um and i think it's just silly to be uh, uh trashing it right now even if the trashing this stuff gets good clicks. I just think it's crazy. Let them launch this stuff. I know Phil Harrison and Jade Raymond personally, and they're good people. And, uh, you know, they've, they've uh, launched lots and lots of exciting products in their respective careers. I trust that they are working on some exciting things here. And I know that they've staffed up with really awesome people. The fact that uh, we've got some, some hot games already kind of being announced as, you know, partners to the Stadia concept is great. So all I'm saying is let's give them a few more months before we start trashing all of this stuff, okay? Let them at least get us closer to launch. Uh, and speaking of uh, Stadia, E3 doesn't kick off until next week, but three new games have already been announced. First up, the long-rumored Baldur's Gate 3 is now official. It picks up after the events of the last game, which was released almost 20 years ago, and we'll see the humans take on the deadly Mind Flayers and the Nautiloids. Original developer Bioware isn't involved, and neither are the studios behind the more recent enhanced editions of the first two games. The new project is instead being made by Divinity Original Sin developer Larian Studios, so hopefully it lives up. 
Uh, no release window yet. Next, THQ Nordic has unveiled the rumored new Darksiders project. It's called Darksiders Genesis, and it's not a third-person game like Darksiders 3, but instead a top-down RPG similar to Diablo. That, that will launch later this year on consoles and the PC, including Google Stadia. Finally, the 3D platformer Yuki, Ukulele is getting a sequel called Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. It doesn't use a 3D perspective and instead combines 2.5D platforming with top-down puzzle sequences. And that arrives later this year. And all of these games will be shown off at E3 next week. I have played a little bit of the... Um, I think I could talk about this. I played a little bit of the uh, Darksiders Genesis, and it's fun. And it definitely does feel like uh, Diablo, and it's a different take on the uh, the whole uh, you know, Darksiders mythology, but it kind of proves out that the mythology that was crafted originally by uh, Vigil Studios, I think, Vigil Games, they did a great job just making something that felt kind of permanent, you know? And I'm, I'm so happy that THQ uh, Nordic is keeping the Darksiders flame alive. Uh, I didn't play so much of the uh, of the game that I have a real opinion on it. I can't review it yet, but I got a nice a nice tasty chunk, and I enjoyed myself. You know, there were a couple of uh, things that were a little hard to decipher and figure out where I was supposed to go, but I, I had lots of fun beating up the bad guys and solving some puzzles and. Uh, uh, earning myself some cool loot. Uh, now, the Baldur's Great Gate 3 announcement was actually in the Google Stadia video uh, with uh, a clip from the, the team at Larian. And I can't believe what a great fit this is. You know, uh, Divinity Original Sin, fantastic games, and that's a great fit for uh, Baldur's, great, you know, Baldur's Gate 3. I know that the, that team was in incredibly influenced by the Baldur's Gate games. So this is going to be... Uh, very cool to see all of this happening, and it's going to be one of the games that we're going to be able to play on Stadia, so I'm psyched about that, too. Uh, so, you know, already some very good E3 news. We're going to have a lot more E3 news and some predictions very soon. But first, let's take a look at this day in Everything Cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for June 7th. On this day in 1993, one of Nintendo's biggest franchises jumped into the handheld market for the first time. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening was released on the Game Boy in Japan, with a Western release following a few months later, making it the first Zelda game for a handheld platform. The game actually started development as a port of the SNES game, A Link to the Past, but soon grew into its own project. As such, it uses the same top-down perspective as Link to the Past, but with one important change. It was the first Zelda game that allowed players to jump. Link's Awakening was also the first Zelda game set outside of Hyrule, with a heroic Link sailing to a chain of mysterious islands to take on his old foe, Ganon. It was a huge hit, with users praising the ability to play an entire Zelda game on a handheld device, and it became one of the best-selling games on the platform. Able to have AAA, uh... All right, lots of good things happening all the time. That's why we like to talk about them in this day and everything cool. And speaking of everything cool, one of the uh, people that knows all about cool stuff and has built himself a very nice career talking about cool things is our friend Jeff Kanata. Everybody, please welcome Jeff to the show. It's good to have you back, my friend. Thanks. Good, good to see good to you. Be here. Good to see you. Um, yes, and and uh, we were talking, and and uh, I it, it made it clear to me that you know. People are busy doing all of the, the stuff that they're working on, and they may not know that we shoot this show in a live venue. You were surprised to find that out, but we actually shoot yeah. this in a cafe. It's oh, cool. at uh, the VFS Cafe at, at 390 uh, West Hastings in Vancouver, and you are welcome to come on down anytime that you want to. I see that question pop up. Where do, where do I get tickets? How do I find out where to go? And that's where you go, and you can see cool guests like this. Jeff, how's your life, buddy? How are you doing? Good. It's crazy. It's fun. It's um, it's it's wonderful. I have a new project. Um, I'm doing a live play Dungeons and Dragons show now called the Dungeon Run, where I'm the DM, and uh, that has taken up a ton of time, but it is it is so much fun. It's such a passion project. So I'm doing that in my video game podcast DLC and uh, the Slash Filmcast as well, talking about movies and TV shows. Uh, so lot, lots lots going on. Very cool. Let's talk about the dungeon run for a second, because this is, uh, I noticed in the credits that this was created by your old buddy from the Totally Rad Show, Alex Albrecht. That's right. And yes. this, it sounds like something that you guys have been talking about for 15 years. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It is, uh, that is how we met. Alex and Dan and I met playing Dungeons and Dragons. 
And that's how the Totally Rad Show started. So it, Dungeons & Dragons has been part of our DNA since then. And I started DMing games with them and other friends for a while. And we talked, we had a concept of an animated Dungeons & Dragons show or a live play Dungeons & Dragons show before people were even talking about doing that years and years and years ago. Uh, never happened. And now live play D&D is like a thing. It's really huge and a lot of people are doing it and it's great. There are a lot of wonderful shows out there. Uh, and so we managed to get the funds to do it the way we've always imagined it. Uh, Alex really put together an amazing cast and crew and we're doing it like a television show. We have an animatronic mind flayer puppet that hosts the show, sort of like the Crypt Keeper from the old Tales of the Crypt. And uh, we have these incredible models that the players get to play on. We have this amazing set and we're just blowing the doors off the thing and people are really digging it. It, it is, I've never worked harder on anything in my life and I am loving every second of it. It is such a blast inventing a world, creating storylines and having adventures with these players has been great. Does it put more pressure on you as the DM, like uh, to, you, you know, perform more and to think about what the audience is going to see? Because you make up a lot of this as you go, don't you? Oh, absolutely. It's an improvised storytelling medium. I mean, it is. I have these incredible plans. I spend I can't even tell you how many hours I spend thinking things through and trying to come up and trying to anticipate what the players are going to do. And then they always do something that I would never expect. <laughs> and that's the joy is figuring out how that's all going to work, what's going to happen. Uh, I think this week I did, uh, I don't know, eight or ten different voices of characters that they came into contact with. And we have another added element that a lot of other shows don't do. We are live and the audience interacts with the show. So the audience can actually affect what happens in real time. So that's a whole other element of being thrown for a loop and not knowing because the audience can change things and interject items and do all kinds of stuff. Um, Is the audience kind of like, a, like a, you know, a partner for you on the DM side, or are they part of the party? Are they, do they represent another player? Or are they, a they, little they, of any... both. The, the, early on, the players found this amulet, and they can communicate to the audience through this amulet, and the amulet can manifest items for them. And so sometimes they're helping the players. They, the, the audience can actually buy forces of good or forces of evil that will affect the audience. I had a force of evil played on me, the DM, which changed all kinds of crazy stuff. It is, it's wild and fun, and the live chat is a blast. People can, they can communicate to the players through the amulet, so they can just say things. It's, it's really fun and collaborative, uh, and people are loving it. I, I've, I've never been part of a project that had more positivity immediately from YouTube comments and uh, reactions I've gotten. I'm so proud of it, and I'm and I'm. It is really a passion project. So That's I hope awesome. people check it out. It's you can find it on YouTube, uh, the Dungeon Run. We just put up episode seven today. Uh, we're also as an audio podcast and live every Wednesday night at six p.m. Pacific time on the caffeine on uh, caffeine.tv slash the Dungeon Run. Yeah, Caffeine is, uh, it's an, it's another streaming video platform that's out there. And it's been, uh, you, you told me about this a few years ago, but it clearly it just keeps building and building and growing. And now they're investing in new cool content like this. Yeah, we're one of uh, two of their first original programming initiatives. Um, and the thing about Caffeine is it's instantaneous. So all of the shows are very much audience participation because it's instant. And it's not like waiting around a few seconds like you have on Twitch or other services. Um, so we're taking advantage of that and um, it's just been a dream. I, the whole cast is amazing and working with Alex again has been so much fun. So I hope people check it out because I want to keep doing it for a long, long time. When you think about this show, it sounds perfect for you, pal. I'm so happy that you guys are doing this. Thanks. Is it, you know, is it bigger and better in your, like in, in the realization of this dream than what you were thinking about years ago? Like, did, did you go beyond yeah. the scope? Yeah. I mean, I never thought we would have an animatronic puppet. <laughs> you know, that's, it's, it's quite something. And uh, I mean, you should see the models that we've got. We have a Hollywood studio building models for us. They're, they've built towers. There's a, the second episode has a fallen tower on its side that I imagined in my head. And then when we saw what they actually built, it was so far beyond what I could have dreamed of. That's and awesome. Yeah, the show is, is just on a scale that I couldn't possibly have hoped for. And even better than that, the people, the, the players that we got, because we cast this show. It wasn't just a group of friends that already existed. We went and cast the best actors we could find, and we got so lucky 
and they're the all big D and D fans. They're all D and D players. Uh, there's actually one player that ha has uh, less experience than others, but it's wonderful because she is learning as she's going, and I love that for the audience to see that happening. For too. sure, it's, yeah, it's really great. That is and awesome. It's also, also family friendly. A lot of these shows, you know, there's f bombs every other thing. Ours is a PG show, and we, I've gotten amazing me messages from people who are like, I watch it with my 8-year-old. I watch it with my 10-year-old. I love it. And uh, so that's a joy, too. That's awesome. How, how old is your oldest now? Uh, he'll be three in September. He's like two and a half. So two yeah, and a half. Okay. So because my my daughter's seven now. So and I want to get. I'm not a huge D and D person. I've been busy with video games, as you know. So sure. but I want I want to I want to play some D and D with with my daughter because we pass by D and D stores and she's like, what's that? I want to go check that. I had and yeah. I had uh, Sam Witwer was on recently and he gave me the book that he wrote. Did you did you see the D and D artifact book? Oh yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Uh, and she so she's been flipping out, but. W what is the right age to introduce a kid to D&D, do you think? Well, I haven't had the experience yet. I, I'm excited to, to get to that point with my kids, but I, I don't think seven is too young. I mean, every parent is going to know their kid. Uh, and, but there are lots of – the thing that's amazing about D&D is it's just a tool set to unlock your imagination. Right. It's just rules to have a, have a story together. And so it can be as – Kid friendly or as adult as your imagination wants it to be. It's it's really just rules. And even in the rules of D and D, they say take or leave any of these rules as you want because oh, it's all about awesome. facilitating story. That is awesome. Have you yeah. heard from the the D and D people? Have you like the the people that actually put out the rule sets and and all the books and stuff? We have been reaching out to them. Uh, I just got actually a tweet. Uh, from from Greg Tito, who's their PR guy, who is super excited. He just saw the show. They had a big convention uh, over the last month that they were planning for, so they, you know, they they were had their hands full. But uh, I think they're going to flip out when they see our show because it it's yeah. on a scale that most of these shows aren't capable of, and that. It, I think I think people are really digging it, and I think I, they'll like I, it. Too. I feel like we're in the moment with this show too. It's like the perfect time to have the dungeon run out there. the The name of the show is perfect. When I see <laughs> it, I see the passion and the and the joy that you guys have. Uh, I'm just I'm I'm ecstatic for all of you because it looks Thanks. like you're putting something together that you really love and believe in. And uh, you know, I, I feel like. I've had a couple of, ge of guests here on EP Live that have really expressed how important it is to do these tabletop games and the social aspect of it and, and how great it is in this, you know, digital first kind of world that we're in on our screens all the time. To sit around with friends and share a story together is really profound and important. And you guys are with the right product at the right time and you love it. It's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I love video games. Don't get me wrong. I do love video games. But there's something magical about telling a story together where you all sort of have an inkling of what might happen, but you're a, you're greater than the sum of your parts. The, the story goes where none of you could have anticipated because you were all together. That's awesome. So in the rundown, I don't know if you were watching the show when we started live, but uh, the first story uh, or one of the first stories was uh, the Uncharted movie, yeah. which is uh, being directed by your buddy. Yeah. And uh, how does that make you feel that Dan is going to be directing an Uncharted movie? I, I mean, I'm over the moon. Uh, it is uh, it is a dream come true. It is uh, it, seeing your friend achieve their dreams and know they are the best person in the world to be doing something like that. And it's a property that I care about and love. And I know how much he loves it and how much he wants to do right by it. Uh, and that, you know, that's, it's amazing. So it's a, it's, if you had told me 10 years ago, I probably would have believed you because I know Dan and I was like, but I also, it would have blown my mind. It blows my mind now knowing that that's the case. I see the announcement of the release date and I'm like, I can't believe that that's Dan's movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's great. That's awesome. Well, congrats to the three of you because you guys are all making dreams come true. How often do you get together with Dan and, and Alex? These oh, days? all the time. All yeah. the time. I yeah. mean, we are, we're actually planning, I think, in the next few weeks, we're going to go and do like a 
uh, weekend. Uh, we're going to get a cabin and just hang out, the uh, us and a few other friends. So, yeah, we hang out all the time. Yeah, we're good That's buddies. That's awesome. Yeah. Is it a I, – I, I know, like, you guys are all busy with your own careers. You're working on different gigs and you're acting and, and you're auditioning for different things and working on different projects. And Alex is producing and hosting and doing things. Yeah. But – you guys have got some real history now, and as you guys are getting older and, and maybe uh, having kids and getting, are you recognizing the value in that friendship even more? As oh time yeah, goes on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dan Dan has a daughter, and I've got kids, and yeah. I mean, it is. These are some of the best friends of my life, and they always will be. And uh, yeah, for sure. That's amazing, brother. Uh, okay, uh, you are going to be at E3 next week. I know how much you love video games. We met at E3, I'm sure. That was probably, well, I don't even know which one. We've known each other forever. And I yeah. sure miss working with you, and I wish I had the budget to just throw uh, some money towards you to, to make reviews on the run again with us. But uh, oh, man. Be Jeff Kanata is the best, everybody. He's amazing. Uh, <laughs> but I know how much you love games. What are you excited about at uh, E3 2019? I think there's a lot to be excited about. If I had to pick one thing... It would probably be the Avengers game yeah. uh, that Square Enix is going to unveil um, because I'm a Marvel zombie from way back. I love Marvel Comics. I love the Avengers. And There's see, no pressure I, on I, that I, game, right? No pressure at all <laughs> for Crystal. I hope, I hope it's, it just knocks my socks off. I, I mean, I know people are saying it's sort of the division or destiny with the Avengers. Okay, sign me up. I'm yeah. in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see what Microsoft is going to show. I think feel like they really have the opportunity because Sony is not going to be there to have the spotlight. And I hope they understand that they can knock it out of the park if they, you know, if they, they pull it off. Um, I'm excited to see if, if they talk about a new Fable. I like that franchise. I would be into that. Um, I want to see more about Cyberpunk. I'm very excited for that game. It's, I think it's, there's a, it's a weird year for those of us you know, you and me who've been doing this a long time. It's yep. a weird year because it's so much has changed, but I think there's plenty to be excited about. Um, you saw the announcement about Modern Warfare, the new uh, the Call of Duty rebrand and the kind of redo. Any thoughts on uh, on that? Are you are you a fan of Call of Duty as a franchise? Um, I have drifted from Call of Duty in recent years, uh, yeah. especially last year. I. I'm a dinosaur who plays those games for the campaign. So yep. last year's iteration didn't really interest me. So the idea that they're coming back to campaign in a really strong way has me more interested for sure. Us uh, dinosaurs got to stick together. <laughs> and I, I don't think, you know, we need to kind of hammer home how important single player games are as often as possible and not <laughs> ever take the eye off of that because look at what was up for best game of the year last year. It was Spider-Man yeah. and God of War and uh, you know a couple of other single player kind of first yeah. type of experiences. They're incredibly important. I agree, I agree. And, and I, I don't think they're going away as you pointed out. I mean, God of War and Spider-Man are two of the best single player games of all time. And yes. you know, it's, we're, we're getting great stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm excited that Call of Duty is is leaning back into narrative, and it certainly seems like they have ambitious ideas about tone. I I'm a little doubtful that they'll be able to pull off what they seem to be indicating, mm -hmm. but I would I'm curious. I I want to see more for sure. Yeah, cool. Um, what about the uh, you, you know some of the the games that are kind of remastered and stuff? Does that excite you? Like, are you excited to play a new Crash Team Racing or Crash Team Racing again? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. I mean, that was never really my jam. I, I, I think it's cool that these games are getting, I think we went through this period of remastering where it was just up stuff and adding anti-aliasing and stuff. And then they like, well, we're going to redo the textures and, you know, and now we're, we've got the Resident Evil 2s of the world and the yeah. shadows of the Colossus of the world. And that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about a complete re- imagining with the technology that we have now uh with these great experiences that we all remember so yeah that stuff i think is super cool and i guess final fantasy 7 is right like that's going to prove it out how important they can be if it's yeah. successful right right are you yeah. are you psyched for that are you a big uh, ff7 fan from back in the day i i played it back in the day yeah. i mean <laughs> i was always more of a pc rpg guy but um i think that yeah, I, I'm very interested to play that again. I haven't sure. played it in a long time, so I would love to revisit that game, yeah. 
The uh, I think the big announcement for Stadia was yesterday, the big kind of reveal and the Founders Pack pricing and everything like that. So today, YouTube is inundated with I hate Stadia videos yeah. and tons of negativity, which is so cool. If, we, <laughs> if everybody could just be super negative all the time, it'd be great. It would be amazing. I, but, I think you got your wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true, right? So um, you and I are birds of a feather, I think, with this... Uh, you know, fin middle finger up at negativity. I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, on Stadia. What do you think about Stadia? I think it's the future. And I think that it is it is democratizing video games. And I think what Microsoft is going to show this week or this Sunday will uh, be more of that. And I think that's the direction that we're leaning. I know people are up in arms about not owning games or being tied to the internet, but. I think that is going to be such a tiny blip of history where we have to be concerned about that. Right. Uh, you and I are, or I've been around in this industry long enough to remember when people were freaking out that the Xbox was not going to have a 56K modem in it. It was yeah. only going to be high-speed internet. And oh my <laughs> God, well, we, they're eliminating all these people on 56K. Yes, for a tiny, tiny fraction of time. Yeah. But the upside of what streaming is going to do and nobody worries about it with Netflix, right? Every, Netflix is normal to everyone. Right. And that's how it's going to be with video games, too. I think you'll still be able to buy and own things, but it eliminates the barrier of entry of a $400 box in your living room. Right. I mean, yes, they're offering a $129 Founders Pack, but you don't need it. You yeah. don't need it. You can literally, everything you, you want to play Stadia, you already own. Just turn on your computer, plug in a controller, and open Chrome. It's yeah. like it, you and you buy individual games. That is a total paradigm shift. Yeah. And this idea of a ten dollar per month fee, like Microsoft is already doing with Game Pass, to play thousands of video games, it's going to change everything. And I think it's for the better. I think it's going to allow people who've been priced out of this very expensive hobby to be able to do it. I mean, all you got to do is look at Disney Plus, right? Disney Plus wouldn't exist if Netflix wasn't a massive success. And here's a company going, well, we're going to just take all of our stuff off of this very successful platform and we're going to build our own and we're going to offer our whole suite of, I mean, that's honestly, that's what it feels like they have been building too. This yeah. Disney Plus is Disney. It's now the way they're going to get Disney into our veins. You know, all of this buying Star Wars and Mar. it feels like it's all been leading to this. They want yeah. that subscription and you can mainline as much Disney as you want and it will, there will be exclusivity across the board there. That is the future of investing in content. You right. want to be able to have a, a person be subscribed directly to that service and download what they want from that service. And yeah. Disney is proving that out. It's not Netflix kind of showed that it was possible. Disney Plus is saying this is the future. This is the way that it is. And Stadia, it had to happen. It was either, it was going to either be Amazon first or Microsoft. It had one of these big players had to do this, right? Yeah, and I think we're all they're all going to do it. I think you've yeah. seen the already the announcements that Sony's partnering with Microsoft for their you know Azure cloud services and Nintendo's partnering partnering with Microsoft for Azure. It, this is going to be something that is going to be a moot point in five years. We're all going to look right. back and be like, do you remember when people are upset about that? Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, and I think we probably do have another five years of people, you know, fighting for physical. And, and, and physical won't go away. There will be stores and outlets and ways to be able to pick up physical. But I, I think it's going to be very analogous to, like, how many Blu-rays do you buy these days, Jeff? None. I, it, the services yeah. are great. And I... I understand the feeling that something is being taken away from you when you're not buying something, but I prefer convenience and downsizing. I, I, I can only speak from my own personal opinion, and that is, it is something I'm willing to give up to just have convenience and, right. and a lower price. I mean, two $60 games a year, you know, you're at the $10 per month fee, so, and you've got hundreds of games to choose from. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's definitely a mind-blowing change, you know. But so was Netflix, and right. so was Disney Plus, and I've heard that Warner Brothers is reevaluating the DC subscription service, and they're probably going to roll all of that into a new Warner Brothers service pretty soon. Uh, it's 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 the inevitable. Yeah, you know? I agree. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, let's get back to E3 titles. Are you what? Are, what are you psyched? We know a lot about what's happening with Nintendo. Is there a Nintendo game that you are most excited for coming I think up? Mario Monday, Maker. Mario yeah. Maker is 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 just I mean, the fact that there's a a campaign. That's insane. Uh, and there's evidently it's these levels are incredible and well crafted and a sort of master class in level design. Yeah. Uh, give me that. Uh, that that product just seems mind boggling with the, the amount of stuff they've jammed into it. Uh, I've never been a Pokemon guy, so yeah, that's the game that I'm most excited about. Nintendo. Yeah, World. Mario Maker is an eternal game, isn't it? It feels like that's a that's as much a part of the portfolio now for Nintendo as any Mario game. Like we'll we'll yeah. get variations on Mario Maker forever, and it will it'll probably be one per console generation if yeah. they keep making consoles. But, you know, the content will flow from Mario Maker forever. Yeah, it's, it's infinite 2D Marios. It's wild. <laughs> What's been the best game you've played so far this year before we go into E3? Or your uh, the, favorite? Uh, the first one that came to my head is Ape Out. Cool. Either Ape Out or Baba Is You. I think those two games absolutely floored me with how original and fun and, and brilliant they are. What is Baba Is You? Oh, it's a puzzle game that I played on Switch. I think it's also on PC. It'll blow your mind. It is, I don't know why somebody didn't come up with this concept before. You play Baba, it's a little uh, sheep, ba, ba, and okay. Baba Is You, and it says it in text on the screen, Baba Is You. And if you move away from that and put something else in front of Is You, then you become that. So let's, let's say it says wall, and there's a bunch of walls on this very 2D flat, boring looking screen. You move your little Baba guy and you push the word wall in front of is you. Now you are the wall and you move the wall and you can move the wall around. And it, it literally, you are affecting the rules of the world by changing the text on the screen and puzzles ensue from that. It is genius. That sounds, you, you sound stoned, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna give this game a shot. I, I mean, that, that sounds incredible. It's, it's I, awesome. I, have you played Sekiro Shadows Dies twice? No, I know <laughs> I should have, but, uh, it, you know, I'm not a From Software guy, really, and yeah. it, I just didn't think it would be my jam. It's tough as hell, but yeah. it's, a, it's a very, very good game. Um, any other titles that you're looking forward to? Any, any other big games at all th at, 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 from E3 that you know uh, about? Yeah, I mean... Um, Outer Worlds, I think, is a game uh, I'm, I'm interested in seeing more of. Um, uh, I guess, you know, the new, next Gears of War will probably be there. I'm sure they'll show more Halo. Yep. Um, oh, the Star Wars game, of course. The, the Infinity Jedi War, Fallen um, Order. What's that? Jedi Fallen Order. Yes, Jedi Fallen Order. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, yes. I mean, I, I think Titanfall 2 is one of the mo most underrated shooters of the last generation. I, I, it might be the best shooter. It's so good. It's right? so good. It, like, just if you categorically look at all of the, the awesome it brings you, it might be the best just out-and-out -out action first-person shooter experience out there. I was trying yeah. to think of, a, of one that delivers m more. I mean, there's, there's things that were innovative, and maybe that team had worked on stuff that kind of changed things before Titanfall, but Titanfall, delivers on so, Titanfall 2 delivers on so many levels. It's it really crazy. does. It's yeah. extraordinary. And, and I, that team with Star Wars, come on. I mean, I think I'm excited to see what, how that game plays. We've seen just a taste of the story uh, trailer, but how it plays is going to be very exciting. Have you got a hands-on appointment for that? You all set up for that? Yeah, I'm yes. really very much looking forward to it. And Cyberpunk, you're going to be checking that out? Yes, indeed. Dying Light 2? Dying Light 2, I saw, I think, last year or the year before. Uh, looked interesting, but you know, I, I do not have an appointment for that game. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, next week we're going to be uh, definitely getting together and comparing some notes, and, and <laughs> I will try to stop you and get some uh, some thoughts on what you have seen. Um, cool. And people can check you out right now on the DLC podcast. Yeah, 5 by 5tv with, slash DLC. With uh, Christian Spicer. That's right. And various guests, and, and you guys do an awesome job with that. Thanks. Uh, and you can watch uh, The Dungeon Run when? I dungeon guess Run is live on Wednesday nights at caffeine.tv slash the dungeon run, or you can find all the episodes we've done so far on YouTube or as an audio podcast. Very cool. Yep. Anything else that you were working on, you busy, busy man? 
Yeah, I do, the Slash Filmcast also you can find at SlashFilmcast.com, talking about movies and TV shows. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right, brother. Thank you so oh, much. Always great talking to you, Vic. Thanks great so much. Great talking with you. We'll see you in, uh, in just a few days. Have yeah. a great time at E3, and, uh, and uh, I can't wait to, to clink some glasses and, and give each other high fives and hugs. Right on, man. Uh, safe right. journey. All right, buddy. All right. See you soon. Take care. All right, you guys. We've got a, uh, a very fun video Ooh. right now. We are going into E3, but let's take a look at the 10 best games before E3. The big show is next week, so we thought it'd be a good time to take a look back at the best games of 2019 before E3. Lock and load. Coming in at number 10, and only because I suck at it, is Sekiro Shadows Die Twice from From Software and Activision. This is a beautiful game with glorious visuals and incredible combat mechanics. You are going to need to learn how to block and dodge and parry, and I'm telling myself this so that I can watch it later and I can listen to the words and then I can proceed to be terrible at this game. But, you know, you can do it. Rally and play this beautiful game and you are gonna have an incredible time. I know that this is gonna be the number one best game for many people out there, but for me, because I just can't beat some of these bosses, almost all of the bosses, it's a really, really hard game, and it constantly tells me how much I am terrible at it, but it's still an incredible experience, and it doesn't matter even if you suck at it. Just keep trying, and just try to navigate through all kinds of nooks and crannies, and you're gonna find all kinds of fun, and depth, and beauty, and just sheer joy in this game, and then you'll get mad. <laughs> Number nine is Metro Exodus, which was a uh, very fun dystopian escape, even though it's bleak and there's terrible things going on in this dystopian Russia and you can't trust anybody and you're going to find all kinds of grotesque abominations out in the wild. It's a much more open experience than we've had in the previous Metro games, which are all good, by the way. All three of the big main Metroid titles are really fun. There's some really cool story elements in here that are almost kind of variation it's almost like a Russian Mad Max, which is cool. I just, I love this franchise, and I think Metro Exodus is a ton of fun. It's a phenomenal game. We can't miss it. Number eight on our list is Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown, and this is a very traditional Ace Combat experience in a way. I mean, it certainly puts you into the cockpit and you're sort of using the cursor to hunt around at enemy targets and you pull off some slightly unrealistic maneuvers because it's not really a simulation. It's more of, um, you know, an arcade -y type of an experience. I played this on the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 4 version also has PSVR support and I highly recommend jumping into the cockpit and trying that out. It's exhilarating. You just feel like a badass in the skies, and the chatter is actually really fun, and you just get totally sucked into this experience, especially because, you know, in this day and age, these uh, flight combat experiences are few and far between, and so this was a very nice change of pace from all of the other cool action titles that we got so far in 2019. Really, really loved Ace Combat 7. Now at number 7 is Mortal Kombat 11, there's a lot of numbers in this list so get ready for that. Mortal Kombat 11 is uh, obviously the state of the art in the Mortal Kombat franchise. They've got away from the days where they used to shoot video of people and then sort of digitize them into the thing, but the characters that they've built along the way, they're starting to edge closer and closer to photo real, these 3D animated creations that they put in there. Obviously with fantastic motion capture support, we actually talked to one of the performance capture actors on EP Live, Eric Jacobus, and he did a bunch of these characters in Mortal Kombat 11. The uh, animations are gorgeous and all of the fan service and the throwbacks to the Mortal Kombat characters from back in the day, a ton of fun. In general, this is just an extraordinary game. Even if some of the microtransaction stuff pisses you off a little bit, it's a great fighting experience. Coming in at number six is Kingdom Hearts 3, and this is just sheer joy, particularly if you play this with a younger player. It's not an especially difficult action RPG experience, but it's really fun and really lovely. The graphics are incredible. Again, taking advantage of some tried and true formulas, but making it super accessible and making it almost look like the movies, you know? Particularly when you're running around with the Pixar characters, the Toy Story characters. Extraordinary work here, you know? I have always been a fan of the Kingdom Hearts games. I can't tell you anything about the stories. I don't really know what's going on except that these Final Fantasy type characters keep running into all these 
Disneyland characters, and they get in all kinds of trouble. There's a lot of death, and then coming back alive, and then you're playing as different characters, and you're like scratching your head, and, uh, and then Donald Duck says something, and you're like, what did you say, Donald? I don't understand you. And then Goofy's in it. And you know, like, what else do you need? It's really crazy, it's fun, and the cameos from all of these Disney creations are worth the ticket price, and they clearly spent the time and worked their butts off to make something special, and it pays off. Big time. Kingdom Hearts 3 is sensational. Set your heart free. Coming in at number five is Devil May Cry 5. It sounds like I'm just spouting out numbers by this point, doesn't it? But Devil May Cry 5 is very reminiscent of the origin stories of Dante and the early Devil May Cry experiences. It plays just like that. It's difficult and challenging, especially if you ramp up the difficulty level, but it's also incredibly accessible, incredibly familiar for anybody that, you know, is used to the mechanics of Devil May Cry. What's cool about this game is that you play as three different characters and you can choose to play as different ones for particular chapters and different story missions and you're at leveling up and adding all kinds of new weaponry to your arsenal and the combos are combo -rific and a blast to pull off and you feel like a freaking badass even if this feels like a game that's kind of out of time and you know a little bit out of touch with kind of 2019 sensibilities i think that's also what makes it so special it's like a throwback to the glory days of 3d action experimentation and it really nails it it really does feel you know like a, a mid-2000s experience but with state-of-the-art set dressing and beautiful visuals and beautiful animations and some laughs some uncomfortable moments but more than anything just sheer fun i'll take you up on that gig Number four is Resident Evil 2, which is a, uh, you know, modern day retelling of the classic Resident Evil game from back in the PlayStation 1 era. This game just looks extraordinary. Beautiful, beautiful work. And what they've done is, you know, they've looked at the old pre-rendered backgrounds and environments of Resident Evil 2, and clearly they've made everything in three dimensions, and there's a lot more interactive elements, and stuff will bust apart. The zombies feel even more dangerous because you can swivel the camera in every direction, and you don't quite know where anybody's going to be popping out of. It's a terrifying, freaky-deaky experience, but it's beautifully made. And it honors the original in some wonderful ways, but it also makes it a fresh new game, particularly when that giant Mr. X, giant hulking beast zombie creature is chasing after you. Jesus, stay back! You're like screaming at the top of your lungs while you're playing, get away from me! That's great game making, that's great storytelling, and that's what makes Resident Evil 2 in 2019 a modern day classic. And coming in at number three is yet another number. This is The Division 2 from Ubisoft and Massive and Red Storm. This is a massive, uh, no pun intended, a global collaboration to build something extraordinary. They've destroyed Washington, D.C., and you just want to explore every nook and cranny of this gorgeous city that they built for us. Even if it's been devastated, even if there's horror around every corner, you still want to go. Everything's been tuned and juiced and it just is so addictive you can ask blake he wasn't a big fan of the division one but he couldn't stop playing the division i think he's still playing the division two blake you should be cutting this not playing the division two but it's hard to stop playing the division two once you start you can't stop in fact i played it on the xbox one for many hours then i went traveling i went to mexico city uh, on a family vacation took a lap my the the p65 laptop and kept playing it started over and i'm playing it on both systems now because it's so freaking good i love the Division 2 and honestly I can't wait to see where Ubisoft takes this franchise to next. This is extraordinary game development. Now number two is going to be a little contentious for you. Thankfully it doesn't have a number at the end of it yet but Days Gone came out earlier this year and it's not everybody's cup of tea but I freaking adore this game. You are chased by zombies, you're chased by zombie wolves and zombie bears. All kinds of grotesque horrors are out there, including humans. As we've seen in shows like The Walking Dead, this kind of is an amalgam of The Walking Dead and Sons of Anarchy, but it was the mechanics of the game that kept me coming back to the experience. I loved getting chased by the hordes. I loved riding my motorcycle. I loved taking out enemy encampments. I was just blown away by the little intricate details. The fidelity of this experience was gorgeous. And of course, Sam Witwer's extraordinary performance as Deke. He's fantastic as Deke in St. John in this. I love Days Gone, and it's number two on my list. 
Now, number one on my list is going to surprise the hell out of you. It's Yoshi's Crafted World, which I played on the Nintendo Switch. I gave it a 10 out of 10, and I stand by it. It's a beautiful, beautiful game, obviously in the vein of the other terrific Yoshi's titles. But I've never enjoyed a Yoshi's game as much as this one since the original Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo. I just loved the aesthetic of it, and I loved the commitment to crafting all kinds of little objects and doodads that would help you solve the puzzles within each of the the different worlds. I was really, really impressed with this. Love the music, love the visuals, love playing this with my daughter. I came away just every time, every night that we played this together, just feeling joyful and just elated by this beautiful, beautiful experience. Yes, I know that it feels like there's a lot of these kinds of games that you can choose, but I guarantee if you give Yoshi's Crafted World some time, you are going to be as... Uh, overjoyed and blown away as I was and that's why it's number one on my best games of 2019 before E3 now we go to E3 and we find out what's in store for us for the rest of the year and we'll see how much this list changes by the time we get to the Rocket and Raygun Awards did that surprise you or what Yoshi's Crafted World number one it's an incredible game don't diss me, man. Go out and check that game out. It's very, very fun. Jamie is here. We've got uh, an Xbox uh, One controller in his hand. We are playing a little uh, The Descenders. It is a, uh, a, a mountain biking game that just showed up on the Xbox Game Pass, and Blake and I saw that and said, you know what, let's check this out. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Downhill Domination for the PlayStation 2. Uh, I'm sure I've done a buried treasure on that once or twice, but there aren't that many mountain biking games for consoles, and uh, this one actually looked pretty fun. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We just started it. I couldn't pass on any wisdom to Jamie. Mm. I, I haven't played this, so good luck, buddy. Yeah. Uh, but while Jamie fiddles around, and um, I didn't change it to, the, to invert, so. No, but it is super hard. Okay, Thanks. good. <laughs> 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 this is great. Everybody's going to love how, many, how much you wipe out in there. Sweet. It, this <laughs> is Let's Play and Chat, so if you have any uh, questions or comments or feedback for Jamie, um, you can go ahead and, and shoot it our way. I ask for all caps, please, to help it uh, be a little bit easier. Vic and Tommy gave uh, Downhill Domination a 9, Blade Blur says. Uh, and Blade Blur also called that Yoshi's uh, Crafted World was going to be my first one. I saw that in the, uh, in the threads there. Uh, great to see Sect Zero or Sect Z saying uh, VR Flight Wings would be a nice one too. You know what? That's what I was supposed to ask Jeff Kanata about was the Oculus Quest. I don't know if he picked that up. He is a huge VR fan. Uh, I've been having fun with that. I'll have a review of uh, uh, Vader Immortal, at least the first chapter, very soon. Uh, I just finished that yesterday, oh! and it was fun. You're a lucky man. <laughs> uh, let's see. They announced the RE2 remake in 2015. I have a feeling they didn't overlap developments with RE3, so if they started instantly, it could be a four- to five-year wait at least, so people are asking for RE3 now uh, because uh, RE2 was such a smash success again. Uh, what did you guys think of the, uh, the list that I put together um, for the shoot? Uh, let me know. Uh, let me know in the uh, in the thread here or in the comments below. Would absolutely love your feedback on that. Would also love to see your top ten games of 2019 as we head into E3. And everything's going to change next week. That's the way it always does. Uh, Black suited Spider-Man. LOL Blade. Um, let's see what we got here. Do a barrel roll. So they want you to do a barrel roll. Can oh. you do that? Yeah, come here and yes. show me. <laughs> yeah. Thoughts on Destroy All Humans what? Remastered? Um, I can. Uh, the track? I think. Yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's it, Jamie. You're cut off, man. You can't drink anymore oh, before man. you go. It's li it's licensed here, man. I'll always wear a helmet. Yes. is what Jamie's showing off to yes. everybody. Uh, thoughts on Destroy All Humans Remastered? Um, I think I can talk about it. I got oh. some hands on with it, and uh, it, it was nice. Yeah, it looks mm. nice. It, it's. Uh, I don't know if I don't know what my embargo is, but I know it's out there. People know that it's there, it um, and uh, I like the franchise. I think yeah. the uh, the the oh. concept has always been cool, picking up cows and doing the missions, and you know, uh, being a, a kind of a jerk to all the humans coming out to shoot <laughs> you and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. It was a uh, fun franchise. Yeah, the uh, the graphics are good. I, you know, I don't think it's gonna blow anybody away, but. I, that knows the franchise, yeah. but I think people that are new to it, I think will, uh, uh, you know, pick up on its charms just like we did when it was out originally. One uh, thing, one thing. 
I miss you, Pandemic. We miss you. Oh, Pandemic. We miss you, Pandemic. Yeah, good call there, man. Uh, question from Rowan Stratovic. Whatever ha to happened to Sean Hatton? Is he okay? Or uh, did he leave the show? Um, he, he did leave the show because we were running out of budget to be able to hire as many people as we wanted to. Um, uh, that was several years ago. He is fine, though. He <laughs> has been able to do some on-camera stuff. Uh, he's got a show on Discovery that's been airing. He's been doing some uh, um, some marketing with different companies and stuff out there. I was just on a, a show that he was hosting for, um, uh, I think, a cancer um, uh, oh, charity right. in Toronto. The uh, and Quest for Cancer. For yeah, something, something awesome. Yeah. But he's always got stuff cooking. And he, the other amazing thing that Sean is a part of is the uh, Cybertronic Spree, which is the rock band that dresses up like the Transformers and tours around. <laughs> and uh, he's the he's the drummer. And I guarantee people have seen YouTube clips of this awesome band. I, it's so funny because he's in that band, and I've seen him at play at Nerd Noise Night and stuff when I've been out in Toronto. And uh, people uh. people in my friends list on Facebook are always sharing videos of the Cybertronic Spree. And I'm like, I know who's in that band. Yeah. Sean in that band and they've got some money to, to make some uh, albums so uh, he's busy and incredibly creative and inventive and uh, I definitely have to have him on the show soon uh, all right uh, thoughts on Spongebob Squarepants battle for bikini bottom rehydrated <laughs> did you and Tommy ever review the original this is from Nintendo Boy 17 um, I have no thoughts on the uh, Spongebob <laughs> uh, remastered uh, but I, I you know I love the character and uh, you know Rest in peace, the SpongeBob. Uh, what was it, Keith Sp Kevin Sp Spenny or something like that? Oh, no. Who created uh, SpongeBob? He passed <laughs> away. Uh, but uh, Stephen Hillenburg, yeah. But you know, incredible character, great sense, great humor throughout those things. I don't remember playing that game. I don't remember reviewing it. It's possible that we did. Um, I'll check it out. Sure. And my kid loves SpongeBob, so we'll definitely check that out. Uh, am I hiring right now? We got two graphic designers and video game experts in here. Uh, no, zero M, I'm not hiring right now. It's a very weird time in media, and um, we uh, augment the amount of daily production work that we do with uh, documentary work and some other stuff that we do. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, we are kind of regrowing Electric Playground the, the best that we can. We're trying to make it all organic. We're not trying to, you know, be... Um, spending all our time selling what we do, we just make lots of stuff. I, you know, I look at a weekly output uh, on the video sort of checklist there that we, I think we're, we're, I think we're making a lot of content, but that's but the discipline that Blake and I have, you know, like we just yeah. came from daily TV. We just built this stuff. We like doing what we do. So we yeah. do this all the time and then we do some other things, but we don't have enough revenue coming in for me to be able to hire people right now. Mm -hmm. um, but please keep watching, please keep sharing. And uh, I keep having some cool meetings. Uh, but in the meantime, I don't like to sit on my hands and wait for somebody to s realize that, yeah, there, there should be you know, great shows about this material with cast members and, and uh, you know, big teams kind of covering all this stuff. It's unfortunate that there isn't. You know? I think the absence of Electric Click and review, reviews on the run from the TV uh, networks that we were on, and thank you to those that did support us. Um, is definitely felt, and I think that the media biz needs a lot more of that. I think there's too many people just ranting about things and being super opinionated about other people's uh, information. And, and um, trust me, I'm trying all kinds of stuff. But in, it, while we're trying things and, t and having conversations, we also make a lot of things. So the best thing that you can do is support us by watching and sharing and, and liking and thumbs up and... Uh, all that good stuff that you do. And we appreciate it very much. Buy a t-shirt if you're a fan of EPN. That would be rad, too. Uh, you can find that at epn.tv uh, slash merch. Uh, appreciate that. Question from Abby Jabison. Uh, do you think Konami will have a presence at E3 given their recent uh, small steps towards coming back to the gaming scene? They, are, they do have a presence at E3. They're showing off a few things, and one of them is an unannounced game. And I've got a... Um, I don't know what it is, but I have a, an appointment for that, uh, and I'm excited to see what it is because they've got some incredible franchises. You guys know I'm addicted to the 16-bit the cartridge 
uh, thing right now. I've got the analog systems, and I keep buying Super Nintendo and Genesis games, and I keep playing Konami games. I'm like, God, this company is oh. awesome. They had so many great games. Double Dribble, yeah, Steel. So, so many. I was playing. I actually before today, before this show, I uh, I got deep into uh, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Turtles in Time. Oh, yeah. I was playing that and having a blast. It's awesome on the Super Nintendo. Uh, I want that Konami back. I don't know yeah. if we're going to get it, but they have lots of great games to bring us. So, so many properties. Uh, as it, Abby, I know you're a big fan. I would love Time Pilot back, please. I bought Time Pilot immediately when they came out on the Super on the uh, on the Switch, but I want a a new version of Time Pilot that takes us deep into the future. That would be amazing. Uh, Blade Blur is putting the uh, uh, the link up to the merch. You're you're the best, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sam, I am one one one. Question: What is your dark horse title in this E3? Uh, actually, I have one. I don't. I don't know what I can talk about. What? Half Life Three is my uh, dark horse title. Uh, you know, like Jeff, I would love to see Fable back. I played one that I want to tell you guys about. I guess I can. I, I can. I, I mean, it's Monday that everything. Should I say it? Nah, don't worry. I can't say it. I don't know if I can't. I don't know. If, I mean, it's not a big game, but it's. It was fun. It was really fun. Help! Screw it. I'm saying it. Desperados <laughs> Three. It's a. It's a. Strategy is back in a big way. I made a lot of appointments, and a lot of people wanted me for appointments uh, to check out new strategy games. And there's a game called Desperados. It's been around for a little while. Desperados Three is coming out. I played that. Got some hands-on time. I had a really good time with this game. It, it's kind of a uh, um, a mix of real-time and turn-based. Uh, Strategy, are you doing great in this game? Look, this yeah. guy should be dead 17 <laughs> times over. Uh, but it's, it's uh, you play as cowboys, and you get into all kinds of cool scenarios, and it's top down, and it was really a nice surprise. Nobody's going to be talking about Desperados 3, but I, yeah, I did right here. It was super fun. Uh, good question, Sam. I am 111. De uh, yeah, Descender, is it the Descenders? The Descenders is the name of this game. This is not how you play it, <laughs> no. by the way. Uh, <coughs> while I think of Desperado, I think of the awesome Robert Rodriguez uh, yeah. action film. I love that movie. That movie was incredible. Um, okay, you guys. It's 5.36. i got time for one more question. Jamie is here. He's got the question. What do you got, my friend? Uh, two questions. Are you tired of going to E3? And what can we expect next week from Am I tired of going to E3? I'm a little tired of uh, going to E3 for sure. I feel like I've been to the buffet a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think part of it, and Blake was kind of cheering me up the other day, because I'm really bummed that Sony isn't there. And it's it. really affecting me, you know, and I hate the yeah. fact that, I've talked a little bit about this, I hate the fact that EA's thing is tomorrow. I don't like that Microsoft isn't in the show. They, they've got a theater space. It's the Microsoft Theater, so it makes sense that they're at the Microsoft <laughs> Theater. But uh, I just, I like all the companies playing nice together. It's, yeah. an, you know, it's a nice visual statement. I've got so many years of running past, you know, there's the PlayStation booth and there's the Nintendo booth. And the business keeps changing, and it bums me out a little bit that, you know, um, we can't stay on the Kumbaya track for a while. But that's part of the joy mm -hmm. of this business and why I've been doing this for 25 yeah. years. It's like I, it, I never know what I'm going to get, you mm -hmm. know? It's totally the Forrest Gump box of chocolates, that's you true. know? And that's, and that's what's going to happen at E3. There's going to be something that just blows me away. I mean, one of my favorite E3s was just a couple of years ago when uh, Ubisoft... Uh, uh, had the developer crying about Miyamoto talking about working on Starlink and, uh, or no, it was uh, the, uh, uh, no, Mario and Rabbids um, uh, collaboration. And it was just so wonderful and human and uh, poignant and, and powerful. And uh, also when uh, Beyond Good and Evil 2, when uh, Michel Ancel came out there and he was cry tearing up to the reaction. That's what I live for, man. You guys know I'm about the people, right? And I, I don't like that the people get smeared across all of these different venues and days. Like, I want everybody to be together. Like, I was talking to Jeff last night. He's, he's running the Coliseum uh, panels, and he's got the YouTube. He's not even going to be on the show floor. I talked to Scott yesterday. He's not going to be at the show floor. He's going to be over in a hotel with meetings and all that stuff. It's like... I want my people all together. That's yeah. what I love about E3. But I am going to see tons of friends, and we're going to get lots of great interviews, and we're going to check out lots and lots of great games. So stay tuned right here. You're going to get lots of good E3 content. 
Good question. You had another one, though. Oh, yeah. What can we expect from ET next week? Next week is going to be a bunch of uh, E3 hands-on discussions, and uh, they're going to be quick rundowns on the run that are going to be about announcements and about stuff that we checked out, and uh, uh, quick reports, maybe some, some sound bites from some people that we um, get some interview time with. And, uh, and then the following week, we're going to be off uh, uh, again to uh, cut lots, lots of the interviews that we've been putting together, but also uh, Blake and I are still cleaning up at the old space, um, and we have to do that. And I'd like to try to get as much of that tackled. Um, so no EP Live the, the week after E3. So we're going to have two weeks of no EP Lives. But we'll be back in full force with lots of EP Lives. <laughs> EP Lives! Yeah! Very soon. Uh, but thank you all so much for watching today. I hope you had fun, and uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that this E3 rocks. And uh, we will see you on Monday with brand new content. Until then, play forever. Hit the button.